Yusha Wright Ian, Sunrise's first super robot show, had proved to be a resounding success for the Dohoku Shinsa Film Corporation and the Bandai Toy Company. Toy sales had even surpassed those of the formidable Black Iron Castle, Dynamic Pro's Majinger Z itself. Yet after its conclusion, it was not certain what would happen to the staff that produced the show. Tadao Nagahama, who had been the series director of the final 24 episodes, pitched a sequel, Zoku Wright Ian. This would not go through, possibly because producers and toy makers had become weary of sequels after Great Majinger, the sequel to Majinger Z, had underperformed. What they took from Yusha Raidin's success was that fresh, original series could push merchandise. To this end, Bandai and the Toei Television Division, not to be confused with Toei Animation, decided to create a new super robot property, one composed of individual vehicles which could be sold separately. The first combining Super Robot series was the 1974 Getter Robo, created by Ken Ishikawa and Go Nagai at Dynamic Productions. It was imaginative, popular, and entirely non-reproducible as a physical toy. Bandai and Toei Television's new property, Super Electromagnetic Robo Combatler V, was designed toy first to ensure that the on-screen animation and the mechanism of the physical toy matched up. More or less. To produce the accompanying animated series, they brought in Tadao Nagahama and his staff. While this effectively buried Zoku Raiden, many of its concepts were doubtlessly reworked into Combatler V. The series closely resembled the earlier Yusha Raiden in a number of ways, not just visually, but in tone and content. Both shows could be shockingly explicit in their depictions of trauma, especially for being kids' shows. Yet Combatler V was clearly the product of a more experienced team. The good episodes were better paced, better animated, and did more to showcase its characters, and the bad episodes, and Combatler V did have some bad episodes, were less frequent and largely less egregious. 1976 was one of the most crowded years for Super Robot shows, with Tatsunoku's Go Whopper 5 Godam, Toei Animation's Gakin and Gaikin, all competing against a host of others. Combatler V was the one that is remembered. さあ、さあね、パトカーの2、3台は潰してもいいから早く来いってことだろ。こいつ、待て。このパスは本物だ。これを持っているものに限りあらゆる法律違反も許され、激進相関の犯行。ま、そんなわけでね、取締りご苦労。The lead is the perpetually cheerful and rowdy Yoma Aoi. Joining him are the easygoing but pragmatic Juzo, the kind-hearted judoka Daisuke, child genius Kosuke, and Chizuru, who also has characteristics. 
Chizuru's grandfather, Professor Nambara, is the head of the enigmatic Nambara Connection. He brings the five heroes together to pilot the Nambara Connection's battle machines, which were built in anticipation for an invasion by aliens from the planet Camp Bell. The battle machines in turn combine into the mighty 57-meter, 550-ton super robot Combatler V. Professor Nimbara is soon replaced by stoic drunkard Professor Yatsuba. <laughs> Professor Yatsuba leads the technicians that maintain the super robot and commands the combatler team from the Nimbara Connection home base. And finally, we have Ropet. <laughs> Ropet helps synchronize the pilots for the vehicle into robot combination serves the occasional plot device, and enables Professor Yatsuba's drinking habit. Contrasting heavily with Yusha Raidin's brooding and long-suffering hero, Akira, the Combatler team are a largely a carefree bunch. Sure, they have their hardships, but they're always resolved by the end of the episode, barring a few two-parters. There's a lot of focus on the team just having fun or enjoying the privileges that come with being world-saving heroes. This is one of the earliest examples of a five-man team in a super robot show, a dynamic previously seen in 1972's science ninja team Gachaman and 1975's live-action Go Ranger. If you've seen any of the Power Rangers or its derivatives, then you're familiar with the style. This is another contrast with the previous year's Yusha Raidin, which had the one hero and then his posse who were largely incidental to the narrative. In Combatler V, everyone is a hero and everyone has a role on the team. There's, there's no Arizo, someone who provides a useful character dynamic but is narratively inert. <laughs> the Nanbara connection itself, which employs the heroes, is presented as an international and extra-governmental institution. The threat of the invading aliens prohibits outright antagonism between nations, but that doesn't necessarily imply cooperation or trust. There's a general Cold War malaise throughout several episodes. <laughs> The lead villain, Garuda, is a joy to watch. Imperial, haughty, and violent, General Garuda is the military leader of the Campbellian Alien Invasion Force. He's not just the bad guy invader, but a sadistic slaver prone to beating both his captives and his subordinates. He's no generic Skeletor, but a genuinely evil person. He can also transform into a bird. Keep that in mind for later clips. Person Garuda and Bird Garuda are the same character. General Garuda serves under his mother, Oleana. Oleana was a renowned scientist on her home planet who had her thoughts and memories transferred into a computer. This computer was then installed into a giant statue of herself, which was sent to Earth long ago to await the orders to begin conquest. As befitting a towering stone statue, she casts an overbearing and implacable presence over the invasion. Her subordinates, including her son, both worship and fear her. Oh, 
ハイライン太陽のエネルギーを最大限に吸収するラインスターミラーの輝かしい眺めやがてそのふるさとから移民が到着しますそれまでにお前は地球をキャンベル星と同じに改造しなければなりません山や森などは破壊し地上の生き物は全てなくしてしまわなければならないのですあ分かっております母上ああこの苦しみを憎しみに変えて戦うのだはい母上 The show has a lot of specificity in its villainy. There's no ambiguity with Eliana's plans or the nature of the Camp Bellion invasion. Under Garuda are three major subordinates, each a gargoyle like, wall mounted half robot. Garua serves as a lieutenant and helps him coordinate his forces. Narua is a slave master who doubles as an engineer and sees to their giant monsters, called slave beasts. These two characters have relatively little screen time and primarily exist to provide Garuda someone to speak at. Garuda's third subordinate, however, is more substantial. Mia's duties are more domestic. Given how she's affixed to a wall, this largely amounts to her playing the harp and commiserating with Garuda over his defeats. Mia's unrequited love for Garuda provides the impetus for several of the better episodes. The Combatler V robot itself plays a prominent role in every episode. It's almost always portrayed either full body or from the waist up. Close ups of its face are rare as it's entirely expressionless. It manifests itself only in its operation, and it operates only as an extension of its pilots, and in particular, Hyoma. The Combatler V robot has a ludicrous number of named special attacks. These include the Chodenji, a super electromagnetic, yo yo, the Wonder Wrist, from which appear a number of questionable gadgets and weapons, the somewhat phallic Big Blast missile, and the Chodenji Spin, wherein the entire machine drills through its opponent. Other attacks include the Battle Return, Heat Ray, Rock Fighter, V Laser, Twin Lancer, Battle Chainsaw, Grand Dasher, Chodenji Spark. Pulse Shock, Cutter Kick, and many others. It has so many attacks, maybe the highest number of any animated super robot. Only the original Mazinger Z comes to mind as a competitor. It was 100% the product of toy builders, although the show's director, Tadao Nagahama, didn't modify its design using suggestions from neighboring children. This actually caused a lot of trouble for Popey, the subsidiary of Bandai in charge of the diecast toy. And they had to make several last minute alterations to accommodate these changes. Super or Electromagnetic Robo Combatler V was a show funded to sell toys. <laughs> In a roundabout way, this gave the creators a lot of freedom. Famed animator Hayao Miyazaki, in a 1982 lecture, Noted that while cartoons based on existing properties had to closely follow their original plot, cartoons designed to sell only toys were much less constrained. As he put it, people who worked on toy commercial cartoons could do just about anything they wanted. For the most part, this meant screenwriters and storyboard writers weren't constrained by the continuity of a pre-existing story. Not surprisingly, this led Super Robot shows to be very episodic. Combatler V is no exception, barring a few two-parters. But unlike its contemporaries, its episodes had a lot more thematic overlap. The show always came back to certain topics. This is perhaps not especially high praise so much as a stark reminder of where the genre was at the time. These were toy commercial cartoons and they were largely not taken seriously. Mr. Nagahama and his team were an exception. 
They seemed to realize how much freedom working on a toy commercial cartoon afforded them and took advantage of that. ああ、人間だらけの街や。こんなところは少年は。よつよ。今人類が滅びようとしているんだぞ。ええ、そうなれば精神するだろう。何？何ばら。俺は地球を愛しこそすべ。人間を愛していないことは知っておるじゃないか
敵よ行け行って子供の敵を撃て憎むべき人間どもに復讐するのだ Jeez, <laughs> I'm a little in awe that the show is willing to introduce this giant teddy bear child and then immediately, gorily, show it killed. You don't get much of that in today's children's cartoons, arguably for good reason. The rest of the episode is more predictable. The mama slave beast appears and wrecks havoc. The whole killing a baby thing weighs heavily on Hyoma, which interferes with the vehicle to robot combination. Eventually, he decides that, as unfortunate as all the business with the dead child was, he needs to put aside his guilt to defeat Garuda. They join together to kill Mama and save the day. And then they hold a funeral. A hell of an ending. Juzo doesn't learn any lesson or suffer any comeuppance for killing the young animal. He took the convenient solution, and that's just how it is. It's Yoma who has difficulty. He has to psych him up over how the Campbellians are just that much worse. And indeed, Garuda and Oleana talk multiple times about having to flatten forests and dam up rivers and the like in preparation of forthcoming Campbellian colonists. What little we're shown of the planet Campbell is an industrial world without visible nature, and we're shown their forces on Earth callously, if melodramatically, directly assault nature. Even here, a slave beast Keel's young child was only in danger in the first place because of Garuda's manipulation. But this is a cult sentiment, isn't it? The Campbellian invaders are evil and Garuda is deceitful and manipulative. But when he calls human cold-hearted beings who would kill even a precious newborn for sport, the heroes don't prove him wrong. Barara niyotte roodo yong no dorei o kari atsumi, kyoryok nessen ho kensetsu no tame, tettei tegi ni hatarakas ete olimasu. Combatler V provides a clear picture of the Campbellians' organization. At the top rung is Oleana. Garuda serves under her, and his major subordinates serve below him. Far beneath, at the bottom rung, are captured human slaves who provide manual labor. Above the slaves are the foot soldiers and slave drivers. The show doesn't hold back in depicting things. The soldiers' blue skin at first suggests that they are from planet Campbell, but it's later revealed that they're human. The juggernauts of the Campbellian military are their giant, monstrous slave beasts. As critical as they are to the war effort, they're treated as poorly as anyone and are frozen in cold storage until needed. Most of the slave beasts seem to be simply very large, dangerous animals, but this is not universal. Some are clearly alien people are conscripted, coerced, or mind-controlled into obedience. <laughs> The show goes into detail on the horror involved. In episode 15, we see the entire grisly process from start to finish. Oh, 
<笑>キャンベル星レッドゾーン基地から連絡があったのは脱走者コスモバードを処刑せよとな<笑>バカなやつよ地球にキャンベル星の前線基地があることを知らなかったのか Putting aside the story and themes for a minute, let's just appreciate this on a visual level. Cosmo Bird has such an incongruently saccharine design. Garuda's D Wing is comically brutal, and then the mind control procedure takes place in this cartoonish Frankenstein's castle of a backdrop. It's like child enslavement by way of Hanna Barbera. <laughs> Of course, as bad as all this is, Cosmo Bird is a child character in a children's cartoon, so it goes without saying that by the end of the episode, the Combatler V team will rescue the poor girl and give her a happy ending. Right? Cosmo, you said that the Earth was beautiful. You said that the Earth was beautiful. The heroes don't save Cosmo Bird. She doesn't get her happy ending. It looks like the bad guys come out ahead this time. This gets into what I said earlier. The show has a lot of specificity in its villainy. Garuda and the Campbellians aren't the bad guys because they shoot red lasers instead of blue lasers. They're the bad guys because they're slavers whose invasion of Earth is an explicit colonial project. Any given episode of Combatler V will touch on either the topic of slavery or humanity's mistreatment of nature to some extent, but there's another motif which shows up more sporadically. Christianity. ハタガイ注文はもっと頭を使うもんや。わざわざ敵さんの的になることはないやで。バッキャラ。親がいねえ君たちにとってここがどんなに大切なとこか手目知らねえんだ。ここは俺の育った施設なんだ。くそ。み
中聖人地球征服軍の総司令官ガルードだこいつがこいつが俺たちの敵の総司令官だったのか気取りやがって生意気な我が偉大なる母オレアナの名のもとに青い氷馬お前に幸福を進めるがどうだなんだとふざけたことを誰が幸福なんかするもんかお前が幸福するならばその代わりとしてその学園のみなしごたちに死んだと思っている親を返してやる見たか青い氷馬この者たちはいずれもお前たちの国では行方不明として扱われているだが奴隷として地底国に囚われていたのだ汚ねえぞお前が私に降伏すればこの者たちは返してやってもよい Hyoma agrees to surrender himself whereafter <笑>さあやれ人思いにやったらどうだ一度は味方にしようと思ったほどの男だ命だけは助けてやる立てその腕ではもはやコンバトラー V を操ることはできまいお前はもう死んだも同然だこれで二度と会うことはない Now, self sacrifice and graphic injury are not uncommon in anime from this time, but take note of the details. Hyoma offers himself up to save the lives of slaves, and as a consequence, suffers what is basically a stigmata. And, by the way, Gruda was completely incorrect about Hyoma not being able to pilot without his arms. Textually, Hyoma pilots through a brainwave helmet that lets him operate the controls with his mind, but visually, he lets Jesus take the wheel. As an aside, Hyoma will get bionic, prosthetic arms in the following episodes, and their maintenance will occasionally be a plot point. This episode is about as overt as the show ever gets in regards to having Christian themes, with a few exceptions, but Christian imagery does crop up with some regularity. One of the more notable things which distinguishes Combatler V from its contemporaries, and again this may be telling of the state of the genre at the time, is the inclusion of actual, honest to God, narrative and character arcs. Mia, Mio Tony Bagarobot to no three dash in his seco style. Connor Saxe on Hanashi Statuki, Bakanisto Ramasta. Ah, Tashkani, Roboto Dosi no coin at Okashi to Shinji Ranaka. Garuda Samawa, coi to you monocarash to Shinji to Orare no Katades. Sasuna Unarashi idea. Corre de Combatra bring a Kiesaru to you, Wakada. Mia is only in a handful of episodes, but she is maybe the most developed character in the show. She is a half-robot, whatever that means, and serves as something of a domestic servant to Garuda. Her earnest love for him is damned twice over, since he doesn't respect slaves and he doesn't respect robots. What, who Garuda respects, are his human opponents and especially Hyoma. <laughs> Oh, Mia, you never really had a chance. 
Initially, Garuda views Yoma with mostly a mixture of admiration and respect, albeit the kind of respect you'd have toward an enemy. But after continually being defeated by Hyoma, his interest becomes more obsessive. This is most explicit in episode 12. <laughs> わかりました。母上。キャンベル星の大将軍として将軍として落第したのだ。せめて戦士として死のうと思う。ガルーダ様。ことに憎いのはあのヒョーマ。奴のために俺は何度逃げようを飲まされたことか。奴を倒してこそ誇りを持って母上に告げることはできるのだ。
ってやってよ<笑>ダイバーを連れてきたのはお前だななぜそんなことをした俺は一人で死に場所を探しに来たのだそれを邪魔しに来るとは己<笑>おきのすぐまで存分に<笑>様のために卑怯者呼ばれを受けたのだこともあろうにあの卑怯魔になガルーダ様お,お手当てをしなくてはかすり傷だ構うなでもえいみや帰れ帰れというのだThere's a lot going on here. Garuda's absurd grief at being rescued, Mia's reaction at her abuse ranging from obsequiousness to near masochism. But let's watch the next scene. Itoshiko Garuda, yo! Oh, Hahawe! Shini Basho mo erare no mama, ima da kono yo ni hikyo mono no haji o sarashite orimas. Are de yoi. Sore i jo onore o hikutsu ni omou koto wa nai. むしきらにしとしい人間と対等に戦う必要はありません。指先でひねりつぶしてやればよいのです。わかりました。ダイバの指揮を取りなさい。我が子よ。はい。急ぐのです、ガルーダ。傷ついた氷魔をダイバの
やむをえませぬガルーダ様が将軍の地位を追われるお願いがございますオレアナ様何事ですガルーダ様に代わって私に奴隷銃の指揮を取らせてくださいほう勝つ見込みがございます作戦は奴隷銃デモンを使わせていただきます<笑>出動を許しましょうあ,ありがとうございます必ずコンバトラ V を滅ぼしてご覧に入れますその言葉を覚えておきますよお待ちくださいオレアナ様もし私がコンバトラを倒した時はどうかガルーダ様をガルーダをクビにしないでくれというのですねはい考えておきましょうそれもこれもお前がコンバトラー V を倒してからのことああ心配はいりませんわガルーダ様コンバトラーは私が倒します命に代わる<笑>話は聞いた貴様が奴隷獣の指揮を取る気まようなよミーお黙り<笑>オレアナ様のご命令により奴隷獣デモンの指揮は私が取りますなるわな,なんだよデモンの出動準備<笑>ギルは答えなさいギルはおお。奴隷兵団の出動準備空間転移デモンの胸へ Let's admire this fantastic setup. Oleana consoling Garuda even as she plans to replace him, Mia scheming to keep him in power, Garuda and Narua mocking her only to be immediately put in their place, and finally, timid, fawning Mia deploying for combat in a giant robot centaur, all while Garuda is napping in a glass coffin like Snow White. Every so often, this show really sets a stage. The fight between Combatler V and Slave Beast Demon is one of the longer ones in the series and maybe the best choreographed. Mia and her demon are giving a lot of fun moves. She is one of the few opponents who really puts Combatler V on the ropes. However, however, the show never lets the good guys lose a fight. Garuda arrives a moment too late, and supposing that Mia can be saved, recovers the body instead of finishing the wounded Combatler. A convenient mishap with his ship allows the Combatler team to follow him to the Campbellian's hidden base. (laughs) 
This sequence is one of the best examples of this series taking a theatrical approach. Most obviously, the staging, the way Garuda and Mia are minimized by these titanic backdrops, how they're giving almost baroque lighting. But it's also the plot. There's the irony in how, in attempting to help Garuda keep his position, Mia inadvertently sets things in motion such that Garuda would recklessly leave the heroes directly to their hidden base. There's also the irony in how only now that Mia is near death does Garuda actually put aside his pride at being a pure flesh and blood Campbellian long enough to actually appreciate her. But the show really goes all out here. There's a third twist on top of the others. ガルーダ1号。記憶回路に異常。スパイ廃棄。ガルーダ2号。キャラクター造形に歪みあり。スパイ廃棄。ガルーダ3号。感情回路を与えたるもシップが起きて。スパイ廃棄。ガルーダ
抜けたもう許せぬわナルマグレ交際を食らえ閉まったバラバラにして一気ずつ料理してくれるわうわこのガルーダと一騎打ちをせよガルーダガルーダ血迷ったか血迷ってなどいないキャンベル星人への怒り浸透に発したまでな、なんとこれはロボットである俺自身のためと今は亡きミーアのためにロボットの根性をかけてコンバトラーと一騎打ちをするのだ何を言うかそなたはこの俺アナがいなければかのわの恨みのミサイル屋を食らえ This final fight between Compatler V and Big Garuda has a similar structure to the fight with Mia's demon. But that fight was the climax of its episode, while the fight with Big Garuda is structured more as a denouement. There's no real expectation that Garuda has a chance. もう決してお前を離さない。決してだ。So that's the conclusion. In a very real sense, this is all recognizable as children's cartoon fare, but it was kind of gruesome for that, wasn't it? Note that premiering in the U.S. during 1976 were Dynomat, The Scooby-Doo Show, and The Clue Club. You don't see too many people carrying a dead body around while searching for a suitable place to end their life on Dynomut. Comparisons aside, I think the ending was excellent. Mia was a great character, and watching her plead with Oleana, put down her haters, and then go after Combatler with outright bloodlust was fantastic. Gruda, myopic, pathetic, always one step behind, always one moment too late, made an ideal tragic figure. And Oleana was wonderful as the stone faced and stone hearted conqueror matriarch. The conclusion of the narrative also tied together several of the themes from earlier episodes. When Garuda learned the truth, he forsook Oleana as his mother and instead called the war robot his brother. He set aside his selfish pride and became a slave beast to oppose a slave empire. He frees Combat l u f f y and saves the day, before effectively committing suicide by combat. As for Oleana, I was a young man who 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 was a y Were there any flesh and blood Campbellians at all? This is obvious to everyone, but just to have it said, the Campbellians serve as an extension of the show's critique of humanity. Their rapacious conquest, their homeworld stripped bare, and the implication they may have already become extinct and are only survived by their war machines and self perpetuating slave empire, that's what the show suggests could await humankind, especially a humankind so alienated from nature. Which adds an interesting wrinkle to the fact that it was not the human team piloting Combatler V which defeated Oleana, but the war robot Garuda. If there's one disappointment with the ending, it's that it doesn't really give a satisfying conclusion to the Mia Garuda Hyoma dynamic. Like, I guess Mia dies trying to save Garuda, 
which is what she wanted. Well, Garuda dies fighting against Yoma, which is what he wanted. But while Mia and Garuda are going through their high melodrama, Yoma basically just does the same hero thing he does every episode. He and his team beat a series of giant monsters. That's any given workday for them. Two stories overlap, but they don't connect. Still, a very conclusive and satisfying ending. For being an early super robot show, Combat V was pretty good on the whole, right? Well, about that. This has all happened by episode 26. Combat V has 54 episodes. A strange commonality in the early Super Robot shows is that several of the better ones had the runtime docked or were cancelled mid-production. This isn't as mysterious as it might seem. Any show that was doing something atypical of the genre, which is to say, something interesting, could attract the wrong demographic and risk provoking the sponsors. Additionally, if a show was cancelled, the writers would need to wrap up their story in however many episodes they had left. It forced a rapid pace and prevented the show from just spinning its wheels. The latter half of Combatler V does have some good stuff, but it's very typical Super Robot fare, and the series does spin its wheels. By the by, most successful anime from this time tended to run a total of 52 episodes, one for every week of the year. Combatler V ran two episodes over this limit, because Bandai hadn't finished producing the toy of the show, which was meant to take its time slot. The second half introduces new villains, the brothers General Dangal and High Commander Warcomedes, yes that is his name and yes it is fantastic, as well as the fierce and serpentine Empress Janella. Warcomedes builds Magma Beasts, the enemy giant monster for this half of the show. Dangal pilots the Magma Beasts, and Empress Janella directs them on their various missions. This trio is recognizably a riff on the villain dynamic made popular by Tatsunoko's kids shows notably the previous year's Time Bokun. In both cases, you had the lead villainess and her two sidekicks, the strong guy and the smart guy. Compare with 101 Dalmatians, Cruella, Horus, and Jasper, or Pokemon's Team Rocket. All three of these new villains are flesh-and-blood Campbellians. So much for any implication that there weren't any, they, they were just slightly off-frame this whole time. That being said, all three characters are solid. They have strong designs. Dan Gale, for all his monstrousness, gets great big puppy dog eyes when he loses. Poor Comedies always bows his head to Janella, but pointedly never lowers his gaze. And Janella's horrific snake transformation is delightful. She anticipates the reader repulsive look by some years. The new character dynamics also permit wackier schemes than the more serious villains from the earlier episodes would allow, and they can be plenty entertaining. よくもこの兄を馬鹿にしたな。あ、馬鹿にしてやる。敵を欺くためにはまず味方から。ということはこの俺を信用していないということだな。俺を抜け物にしてこれだけ大事な計画を進めるからには。そうであろう。黙れ
つもお国のためにご苦労様ではあります。ご苦労様です。は、恐縮であります。どうも。こいつらもいずれはコンバトラータイに入れてもらおうと思います。あ、あ、足は今度皆さんの食事のお世話をさせていただくことになった一の金木ベイリー。おほう、新しく来るコックさんというのはへえー、こっちが母ちゃんのモモエちゃんおやきんたあたいちえケロケロンペテーのモクペイモモエ join as personal chefs of the combat loot team and their questionable cooking and rural ways make them the butt of a handful of jokes however it's their kids and their kids frog karope who stand out the most Chie, Kenta, and Kurope not only become good friends of the main cast, but they also coerce Kosuke into helping them build a robot of their own, the Muppet like Kara. <laughs> Kurope will somehow end up saving the day multiple times. ありがとうよケロットお前のおかげで怪我がちできたぜおい金太知恵返事ぐらいしろよおばそら万歳にケロはあ<笑><笑>第第2。Certain problems become endemic to these later episodes. On a purely technical level, a lot of the stock footage looks washed out. The final attack stock footage instead has a purple color cast. That may have been an intentional stylistic choice, but I can't help but speculate if it was an attempt to mitigate possible damage. In addition, the backgrounds tend to have little less detail, the animation isn't quite as smooth, and characters are frequently drawn off model or out of perspective. Story wise, These episodes tend to introduce narrative elements that don't go anywhere. We might learn that a character is embarrassed by a flaw only for it to never come up in the story, or that the Nambora connection has built a powerful weapon only for it to be used once and never again, or a side character might show up only to vanish halfway through the episode. Many of the latter episodes have a heavy character focus, which is awkward when the status quo of the show means that you can't really have character growth. For example, there's maybe three different episodes where Professor Yatsuba gives up drinking, which、uh, is something of a rough chuckle. There's also a tendency for battles and even whole episodes to end abruptly. No matter what happens earlier on, no matter the circumstances, at about 21 minutes and 30 seconds in, the Compatler V robot will use its Cho Denji spin attack and just win. A lot of plot lines are also recycled from earlier episodes. Episode 35 has Professor Yatsuba be captured by the enemy, which happened earlier in episode 20. Episode 39 is about Daisuke reuniting with family, which was similar to episode 19. Episode 51 has Juzo struggling to save the life of an older mentor, which was exactly the plot of episode 8. And episode 44 features a slave monster mourning their dead child, which we saw with Slave Beast Keel in episode 9. 
Another noticeable failing is that the characters are so tuned for comedy that when the series tries for tragedy, the effort falls flat. Take episode 41, The Despicable Hostage Plan. バリアドームだ。バリアドームに間違ってポリ包まれておるわい。おそらくこのバリアを破るにはバリアエネルギー消化と同じ周波数のエネルギー頭部つけて飽和させるしか手はあるまい。問題はそのエネルギーだな。そ
親父やおふくろと幸せに暮らした時を思い出させてくれる唯一のところだったんだじいさん俺たちでやってやろうじゃねえかじいさん見ていろ町中の金という金を鳴らしてみせるぜ頼んだぞみんなマリアのためにもどうしてもコンバトラに勝ってもらわなきゃならねえんだ行くぞああ間に合ってくれよな So, what the hell do we make of this? Poor little Super Maria is played for humor and pathos in equal parts. I do like this episode. It has my attention in a way that some of the other later episodes don't. But even so, I don't know that it lands quite as well as, for example, the earlier episode with Cosmo Bird. Like, is it supposed to be a joke that the name of this nice little girl who dies, a veritable perfect cinnamon roll, is basically an anagram of Mary Sue? Would any of the writers have known that was a thing? Maybe? The comic and tragic elements don't mesh well. It feels incongruent. One difference is that this episode has War Comedies as the murderous villain, while the Cosmo Bird episode had Garuda. Garuda's sadism and theatricality gave him a kind of Tim Curry vibe that provided a level of abstraction. War Comedies is too straightforwardly a comic character, and it makes the child murder feel awkward. It comes across like it's trying too hard. Trying too hard describes more than a few of these episodes. Another has Yoma taken who he thinks is an orphan girl, only for her to be revealed to be entangled in a plot to assassinate him. She has a change of heart and dramatically dies, saving his life. Now that I think about it, this series has a lot of dead girls. A anyways, we also have an episode where Yoma reconnects with a rival from his orphanage, who is recruited as a potential backup pilot. Once again, his rival dramatically dies, saving Hyoma's life. Poor Hyoma can't catch a break. In all cases, the tragedy is just too tragic. I can't take it seriously. The set of the show and the Hanna-Barbera style villains can't pull it off. The one place where the tragic elements do work is with General Dango. He steadily grows disillusioned with Empress Janela and the Campbellian cause and develops a deep self loathing as his win loss record against the Combatler V team nears 0 to 25. But even this is basically a retread of Garuda's earlier character arc, so we're back to the series recycling things it's done before. Kapatler V just doesn't have 54 episodes worth of story. This pronouncement begins episode 52, the first of the final three episodes of the series. It's largely a string of fight sequences in which the cast of villains is slowly winnowed. First, Empress Janela activates a time bomb in General Dangale's helmet, telling him she'll disarm it if he successfully defeats the heroes. 
Dan Gale leads one final desperate charge to save his life. ご覧の <laughs> Of course, Dan Gale does ultimately lose. The show does not shy away from showing his fate. Now we move on to the second to the last episode, number 53. This time it's War Kimidi's turn to fear for his life. あれは once again, we have an episode that's a series of fight scenes with Janela leading the Combatler team to Paris, only for war comedians to attack their home base in Japan. Yada yada, Combatler makes it back in time to defend its base. Yada yada, war comedians is defeated. It mostly plays out without surprise, but there is one thing I want to call attention to. Firstly, Chie and Kenta, lovable rascal children, are in the Nambara connection with the professor. Secondly, the villains do succeed in blowing up the connection. <laughs> This is where the episode ends, but we've all seen kids' cartoons before. Y'all can guess that the next episode starts with the reveal that everyone in the connection somehow escaped safe and sound. And you'd be right, to a point. Chie and Kenta aren't in this shot, and they don't feature in the last episode at all. I I guess they just exploded. Anyways, let's catch up with War Comedians. Outside of the admittedly solid horror of Workimedi's unpleasant transformation, the last episode is pretty mediocre. It is, once again, a string of fight scenes, 
but this time the choreography is trash. Parts are nearly indecipherable. Things look bad for our heroes, but then Professor Yatsuba shows up in a new connection to help out. It flies now. The added firepower is just enough for Combatler to win. I love super robot cartoons, and I love watching giant robots fight each other. I mean, I'd have to to make these videos in the first place. But this is episode 54 of a series which could have easily concluded ages ago. So it's hard to be satisfied with Combatler V once again fights just a tiny bit harder and so saves the day. By this point, that's trite. But that's not what happens. <laughs> やはりお前たちの負けだ。私が帰らぬ時はアスボムが発進するしかけ。アスボム<笑><笑> この地球が俺たちが地球上のあらゆる生物はあと まだ雲が晴れたわ。美しく空じゃなかとね。一遍でよか。焦げ色の空ばっか来たかったとです。ジュゾ。アイナ。大作。うん。チズル。コスケ。いるよ。ありがとう。ほら、お前たちのような仲間ができただけでも、俺人間に生まれてよかったと思うよ。つくしょうね。あと Here is where things get weird. That's right, just when things seem most hopeless, God shows up. キャンベル星から。天使長い間キャンベル星を支配していた戦いをこのむ勢力は全く駆逐され、我々平和主義者のもとに秩序を回復した邪悪なキャンベル人のため最悪を被った地球人に深く詫びもし上げる。これにつけ
ここまで戦った地球人の勇気と闘志に同じ宇宙生命体として尊敬の念を禁じえない。That's right. Just when things seem most hopeless, God shows up. The end. <laughs> okay, so Deus is actually just an emissary from beyond the stars, and is not the capital C, capital G Christian God. But take a look at what happens in the story. Commander V fights well and defeats all its enemies, although Janela herself is actually killed by Robo War Kamedes. But despite this, they fail to save the Earth. Hard work, good works are not enough, and the Earth and all mankind are ultimately and only saved through literal otherworldly grace. Looking back, this isn't anything new for the show. Combatler V repeatedly defeats opponents, only to fail in other respects. In particular, the people the hero set out to save frequently die, or victory over the enemy will only be possible through a regrettable sacrifice. This isn't even the first time the heroes are saved by a Campbellian. Oleana had the upper hand back in episode 26 before they were rescued by Garuda. There's actually some visual connection between Garuda and Dias. They both have the same Romanesque thing going on. If it weren't for the blue skin, you could almost believe they were father and son. Those aren't the first robot horses on the show either. Compare them with Demon, the slave beast that Mia commanded. We are told that the day was saved because of an off-screen revolution, which directly mirrors Garuda turning against Oleana. In a roundabout way, the show is presenting Mia and Garuda as the most significant characters in saving both Earth and Campbell. It's their model of revolution that wins out. Early episodes didn't hesitate in being very critical of humankind. Given how the Campbellians work as part of that criticism, how should we interpret this ending? And how wild is it for this to be the conclusion of a toy commercial cartoon from 1976? Combatler V is very much of the 70s, and it's not always great about its female characters. It did better than some of its contemporaries some of the time, but it wasn't fantastic. ようこそ諸君私が君たちをお招きした南原だそしてこれが孫の千鶴ですよろしく<笑>すごい僕の理想のタイプべっぴんやなあ<笑>んだよおっさんは自分の孫を見せるために俺たちを呼んだってのか<笑>チズルー being the one girl on the combatler team receives the most screen time of any woman This is rough because for much of the show, she's the least developed member of the team. Let me compare her with Marie, a character from the animator's previous show, Yusha Raideen. Marie was the main character's girlfriend, but she was also one of the gang. She caused mischief, she went on adventures, she got into and out of trouble with her friends.、Uh, in short, she was a full character. Chizuru, on the other hand, is just the girl for large swaths of her show. And while there are a couple of Chizuru focused episodes, each team member got a few, she isn't given consistent characterization. It feels like the writers didn't know what to do with her. Eventually, by which I mean 23 episodes in, the show decides she's a mechanic. It makes sense that she'd know how to fix the machines, since they were her grandfather's invention, but it's not really expressed in her personality. She's no gadget hack wrench, is what I'm saying. Chizuru does get more character development and more screen time in the latter half when Chie and Kinta, may they rest in peace, decide to play matchmaker and set her up with Hyoma. Which. it is what it is. There's some more straightforward ugliness, too. We get more than one shower scene, which are brief and not too explicit, but are nonetheless unpleasant and intrusive. There's also this scene of her speaking to her doctor. Soon, you must shoot in a seal narrow. Couldn't then a much on the cotto. So now the motten of Cayo. So no, Shinzo Ben Maxo knew answer dight. Those the conan armada cacus de tanoya. 
先生お願いこのことはみんなに黙っててくださいいつガルーダが攻めてくるか私は医者よ四谷博士に行って出動を禁止してもらいますこのまま出動すればあなたの命が危ないのよ先生それだけは許して緊急事態だわ行っちゃダメよ This clip is Compatler V passing the Bechdel test. The women on the villain side fare a bit better. Oleana may be a literal stone statue and Mia a domestic servant, but they are complex and interesting characters who have a lot of agency in the story. Janela also becomes a very active character towards the end. I, I think it's largely a matter of prominence. There are three women among only a few villains which gives them more room to be their own characters. Chizuru is stuck being the one girl among all the good guys. That is, aside from Chie and aside from a few girls that show up for one episode and then die. Which, that also might not be that great. Later shows from this animation team are a little better about women, but Combatler V isn't quite there. Garuda is fun, charming, and a sadistic monster. He's the best part of most episodes he's in. He is also a fascinating character as a historic example of his type of villain in a kid's cartoon show. You could draw a line from Garuda and villains like him to comparatively modern characters like Zuko from Avatar, Katra from the new She-Ra show, or V-Roll from Garan Lagan. And I'm sure viewers can come up with several dozen other examples. <laughs> The big distinction between them is that newer characters usually are less straightforwardly evil and undergo some redemption that has them join the good guys. Garuda's evil is far more brazen, and while he does turn against the Campbellians and come to identify with the slaves, there's no real atonement per se. He does not join the good guys. You can almost imagine the discourse around Gruta if Combatler V were a show airing today. Is it okay to enjoy Gruta as a character, knowing that he beats his subordinates? Could viewers still like him, given that he does run a slave empire? Is it problematic to find him cute, even though he ripped the wings off of a child? <laughs> I, I tease, but I do think it's useful to see how the show presents his character. Garuda is theatrical, and I mean that very literally. He, and Oleana and Mia as well, all behave as if they were in a play. There's a lot of wide motion, exaggerated expressions, he projects as he speaks. In short, he performs. This is in contrast to the heroes who tend to speak and behave much more casually to one another, even during tense moments. This performance makes it seem as if Garuda is only playing a part. It highlights that the cartoon show is, in fact, a cartoon show. There isn't a real Cosmo bird getting her wings torn off, it's all pretend. This sense of abstraction makes Gruta's evil seem, at worst, like an older sibling mistreating a toy. This even applies to his relationships with Mia and Hyoma. The performance takes what is narratively abuse or antagonism and turns it into camp or maybe roleplay. Like, this isn't not kink. This ties into something I brought up way back at the start of the video. Before Combatler V, when Tadao Nagahama took over from Yoshiyuki Tomino as director of Yusha Raiden, one of the first things he did was introduce new villains. In doing so, he killed off previous villain, Prince Sharkin. This brought him a lot of angry letters from fangirls of the show, because Sharkin and Akira were a popular slash pairing. Garuda's whole character was in response to Sharkin's popularity. 
Where Sharkin was unexpectedly popular with a demographic the show wasn't targeting, Garuda was purposefully aimed at the heart of preteen girls. And sure, Garuda also dies midway through. But wasn't his death romantic? So of course Garuda is theatrical. He does, after all, have an audience. I couldn't do a video essay on Combatler V without mentioning the yo yo episode. ああ、誰もまだいい考えが浮かばないじゃないか。まあ、こすけたらすごいわ。大した奴ばい。俺はダメだ。わしもまず全身をメッキすることは考えてみたんだが、メッキするにはアルファ光を溶かさねばだろう。しかしそれを溶かす液が見つからんのじゃ。もし
The yo-yo episode is entirely unrepresentative of the show at large, and as such it nearly didn't even make it into the video. But, come on. I couldn't do a video essay on Combatler V without mentioning the yo-yo episode. Way back in the day, in the distant era of 2005, the Western anime fandom was very different. This was the era of file transfer over IRC, Direct Connect Plus Plus, Animeski.com, and Crossopter EGI. And if the Western anime fandom was different, the mecha fandom was almost unrecognizable. Very little was available translated, and doubly so for older work. At best, some fan group would release one episode every month or so, and you'd just hope they stay together long enough to make it through a series. This is when my copies of the old English Combatler V fan sub are dated. I don't know what group translated them, and if you do, by all means let me know in the comments. But by 2005, there is a complete set of every episode. This video essay was produced from the Discotech Blu-ray release, but I thought it'd be worthwhile to compare them with the older fan subs. By and large, the translations agree, but the fan subs present things in a more humorous light. Where the official translation has Garuda withholding a weapon for tactical reasons, the fan sub has him imperiously declare, we shall wait for them to form their robot. It's similar, but the official translation presents him more seriously, while the fan subs make him to be a comic villain. You see this approach elsewhere, and sometimes it works well, and sometimes it doesn't. In the fan sub of the Oyo episode, and Daisuke somewhat sarcastically refers to Kosuke as the boy genius instead of using his name. It matches the tone of the scene better than the more direct official translation. However, in a later episode, where the Nambara connection is occupied by the government, the official translation tells us that the government doesn't restrict Ropet because they don't recognize that he's a person. While the fan sub winks at the audience and tells us not to worry about why Ropet can just walk around. This ironically misses the much darker joke which points at the show's slavery themes. The joking tone of the fan sub works cross-purpose. There's also a handful of occasions where it seems the fan subbers were tripped up by technical terms, and some scenes don't make much sense as a result. I can see fans of the humor preferring the older translation, but these days I think it's mostly interesting as a curiosity. The new translation is more often aligned with the themes of the show, has dialogue that's more consistent with the cast's characterization, and is plainly more accurate. As the folks said back in the day, support the official release. The mid-1970s kind of straddles the divide in Japanese animation. Further back, you get shows that are episodic and often narratively bizarre, uh, I think the original Speed Racer. While further forward, you get the serial stories that define modern anime. Kamala V is a show caught in the middle of that divide. Much of it is wild to modern sensibilities, but it does have a thematic and narrative continuity that many of its contemporaries lacked. This is often attributed to the influence of Tadao Nagahama, the general director of the series. He had a background in theater and puppet theater, and many of his robot shows would have elements of taiga dramas, a genre of televised Japanese historical drama. These include a strongly defined conflict with strongly defined villains, moral ambiguity, a strong focus on human drama and emotions, and storylines often dealing with blood ties and family loyalty. These romantic story elements have led to the robot shows he directed to be called the Nagahama Romance Robot Series, or the Roman Robo Series for short, of which Combatler V is the first. In hindsight, Combatler V might be thought of as a testing ground for his style, because while those dramatic elements are certainly present, they're not always prominent. They become much more conspicuous in his later shows, such as Voltus V and Tosho Demos. To understand something Combatler V does, and to better examine its influence on its successors, let's look at the central metaphor of the combining robot. Everyone pools their strengths as a harmonious whole, joined together as a single body, to fight back against an insidious, invading, alien other. This is the kind of thing that can get quite ugly if you're not careful, 
and has led to some Japanese super robot and sci-fi shows to be criticized as nationalist. Not always without merit. Battler V addresses this in two ways. First, by being very specific about who the villains are and why they're the villains. Oleana, Janela, and their minions are bad not because they're aliens from outer space, but because they are specifically colonizers and slavers. Secondly, Compatler V is very specific about who the heroes are and why. It's not always the humans, and it's not never the aliens. But that's Compatler V when viewed as a whole. It may not come across in any given individual episode. Its immediate successors, Tadao Nagahama's own Voltus V and his colleague Yoshiyuki Tomono's Zambot III, are much less subtle. Voltus V goes heavy on familiarizing the alien other, uh, literally, while Zambot III instead takes a very pointed and very uncomfortable look at alienation and otherness. Giant super robots piloted by five heroes is a firmly established genre trope, and it began with Compatler V. The real legacy of the show, however, is how it broadened the type of stories the genre could tell, and being the leading edge of a trend toward more explicit anti-fascist themes. Over the past two decades in the West, the old super robot shows have gone from being something only available to and watched by a niche fandom from within a niche fandom to something readily accessible. But just because something's available doesn't mean it's worth seeking out. Most people probably wouldn't consider Combatler V a good show, and on the whole it probably isn't. But it can be a fascinating watch. It's a wild example of a traditional kids show that's nonetheless extremely frank about trauma and death, and also a strange evolutionary middle step between the purely episodic shows that preceded it and the truly serial narratives that came afterwards. And even if it's not good on the whole, certain episodes are still very entertaining and I'd recommend anyone with an interest in older anime to consider seeking a few of them out. If that's you, by all means, take my list of the good episodes into consideration. If you're interested in the kind of show Combatler V is, but would prefer something with more consistent quality, you could check out Voltus V instead, and the later Robot Carnival's Strange Tales of the Meiji Machine Culture is probably the apex of the form. Combatler V is available translated in English on Blu-ray, something I'm still a little amazed at, and I've been told that in certain regions it's available on YouTube as well. God willing, that won't give me any grief when I go to upload this. Combatler V is also a playable unit and translated into English Super Robot Game, Super Robot Wars 30. That's something I know several people are very amazed at. The point of this video and Super Robot Blueprint is not necessarily to lionize or proselytize these shows, but to show that they can be read critically. They're toy commercials, but there's something to them. It is trash, but it's art. Machine, yet 